I welcome you all you. on behalf of the Arab Youth Climate Movement Qatar and Global Shapers Doha Hub to yet another edition of our Earth Talk series events in partnership with Qatar Foundation's Education City Speaker Series. We are grateful for Qatar Foundation for their continued support and for collaborating with us in this event. And we'd also like to thank Qatar National Library for hosting us in this beautiful venue. Mr. Owais Sarmad, our esteemed speaker today, we would like to wholeheartedly thank you for accepting our invite and for choosing to come to Doha to shed light on a topic that is more relevant, becoming more relevant, more pertinent and more dangerous every day. We appreciate your time and we appreciate your efforts. I am Hassan Amy and I am a board member of the Arab Youth Climate Movement Qatar. As part of the AYCM's Earth Talk series, we aim to bring eminent environmentalists, practitioners, diplomats to discuss global environmental issues and contextualize them in a local context, in a local sphere. Make it relevant to Qatar. After launching our first Earth Talk series in 2017, in December, we have since then hosted several speakers and several environmentalists, ranging from Dr. Vandana Shiva, uh, an environmental activist, and also the IPCC former chairman, Dr. Rajendra Pachuri. So I bring our message to a wider audience like you today, to get more exposure, to get more engagement, and to get more interest we decided to amplify, to amplify our voice in the community through partnering with Qatar Foundation's Education City Speaker Series. As you may know, the Education City Speaker Series is a platform where experts and professionals from various fields come together and discuss points that are happening around us and are relevant to our, in our world today. The Arab Youth Climate Movement Qatar is a newly registered independent non-profit organization. We are currently a group of young professionals who have decided and committed to come under one mission. Our mission is to build a movement that fosters an understanding of what our ecosystems are, to better understand our ecological issues, to understand the climate crisis in a deeper sense, to foster communication, to research, to develop policy recommendations, and to come together in, in finding a solution through not only stakeholders, but also the larger community. In the following months, we are committed to work with all of you, whether you're a stakeholder, student, a professional, whatever it may be, in fulfilling our strategy. Our strategies are focused on three main pillars. If I was to simplify it to you, it would be to learn, to teach, and to share information. By learning, we decided to focus on grassroots education programs. We want to reach schools, we want to reach education institutions, and raise awareness about what our ecology looks like in Qatar, what, what it comprises of, what are the issues that we are facing in our specific environment. We seek to teach by capacity building workshops. As you may have heard, we have already started planning for this where we will be hosting several workshops in order to teach our community how they can make a difference and how they can be active members with us. And the third is sharing information. Our organization is committed to evidence-based research. We are committed to quantitative and qualitative research that will drive our policy recommendations in the hope of us being able to make a difference in the way we uh, mitigate, adapt, and conserve our environment. We hope that you join us in supporting AYCMQ. We are a new organization, we are now a small organization, but we do hope to grow in numbers and we are committed to grow in impact. But rest assured that your support is vital for our strength. Thank you. Now it is my honor to uh, first, no, at first I will share a video with you about Qatar Foundation's Education City Speaker Series and then from there, Mr. Nishad Shafi, the Executive Director of AYCMQ, will give you a few words.
Distinguished speakers and environmentally conscious society of Qatar. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. This Air Talk series is perfectly timed ahead of ambitious UN Climate Action Summit hosted by His Excellency United, Secretary, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres and ahead of UN Youth Climate Summit and also upcoming COP26 in Chile, a moment which politicians across the world are prioritizing climate change as never before. Students are skipping schools to attend climate march, and governments are attempting to rein their global carbon emissions to meet their Paris Agreement. As we stand today at a turning point, it's critical to understand global climate change needs a lot of cooperation and urgency to tackle this crisis. To discuss more, we have today amongst us Mr. Ois Sermon, who will share his insight. Mr. Ois has been part of UNFCCC since September 1st, 2017. We are extremely grateful for him to accept our invitation and to come to Qatar and to be part of Earth Sox series in partnership with Qatar Foundation. Mr. Samad previously served as the Chief of Staff at International Organization for Migration in Geneva. He worked in several management and policy capacities at IOM over a period of 27 years. He was graduated from Osmania University in India as a Bachelor of Science. I call upon Mr. Sarmad to give us the keynote speech of today and all awaited speech. I welcome him. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Salaam Alaikum. A great pleasure, great honor for me to be here. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, and very importantly, the youth, the students, the children who are here participating in this very important uh, event today. And I really heartily like to thank the hosts, Qatar Foundation and the Arab Youth Climate Movement uh, of Qatar for inviting me here and representing United Nations Climate Change Secretariat, United Nations Climate Change Organization, that we are at the center of within the UN system to addressing the threats, the challenges of addressing climate change. So it's a great, great, great pleasure for me to be here. As I said, especially the youth, the children, the, uh, the younger population, the next generation, and in this amazing venue, the library, the center or, or uh, a place where learning, the knowledge resides and is accessible. Before I start, let me share with you or read out something that I uh, feel very relevant for today's discussion, and that is to do with Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement you must have all heard about. You know what it is. But there is one particular article. It's very simple, straightforward, which is very relevant for today's discussion. And it reads as follows, parties, when it says parties, parties means the delegations of the governments shall cooperate in taking measures as appropriate to enhance climate change education, training, public awareness, public participation, public access to information, recognizing the importance of these steps with respect to enhancing actions under this agreement. So that article actually very nicely summarizes the essence of the agreement, the Paris Agreement, which is an extremely important agreement. I'll talk more about it in a minute. But that is very relevant to our discussion here today. The engagement of all of you that you're present here, this is about sharing knowledge to agree, to understand, to, and to take collective action. And that's why we're here today. Before I get into the details of what I'd like to share with you, I'd like to share some facts, set the context, 
recognizing many of you know about climate change, the, the work of the United Nations in the climate change process, the COPs, but sometimes there are some abbreviations and certain technical uh, terminology which requires a brief understanding. To start with, let me give you a historical perspective. In 1992, the world leaders, the governments, the society as a whole realized that we had a problem. That is to, that the environment that we are living in, that we use, is going through a serious challenge in terms of degradation, in terms of impacts of carbon emissions, in terms of land use, in terms of the way we are resourcing the energy needs of the world. So at that time, a decision was taken in Rio, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, where governments decided and adopted three conventions. And those three conventions were one to combat desertification, the second one was to address climate change, and the third one was to address the impact on biodiversity. So those were the three conventions, the very important decisions, conventions as we refer to those, were adopted in Rio in 1992. And those three conventions then took shape and organizations were formed of those three conventions. So I represent one of those, climate change. That is based in Bonn, the other two, one, the desertification is also in Bonn, but for bi biodiversity it's based in Canada and Montreal. So those are the three very, very important conventions and that launched three work streams and tracks to address those three fundamental and critical aspects of the environment in which we live. To complement that, since then, there have been other de decisions that were taken at the global level in the United Nations. And many of you, again, know those, but just to repeat, the 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals, the no goal number 13 is climate action. But I always like to refer climate action with also goal number four, which is quality education, because we cannot address any existential societal changes without educating the society at the grassroots level, at the children level. Otherwise, many other things that we do are mostly bandaging. But if we want to bring about the societal change, and I was very heartened to uh, uh, hear some of the students just now this morning, or a few, uh, an hour ago, about their understanding of the impacts of climate change and what solutions they have been able to conceptualize and find solutions to it. That's brilliant. That uh, really, it made me very, very appreciative of that. The other agreements were finance for development because that is another very important aspect of addressing global challenges. That appropriate finance, financial resources have to be made available by the international community to those who suffer the most. And the third one was the Sendai framework. That is to address the disaster risk reduction knowing that the world is suffering from various disasters, both man-made and natural disasters. So that was another agreement. Another one which is not as well known is the Samoa framework. And that was specifically to focus on low-lying islands in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, in other parts of the world, who are at the forefront of the impacts of climate change. So those were very important agreements that complement the other three, three conventions, and we uh, take those into very much into account in our discussions. So, so the convention, it started the process, and that process is what we uh, engaged in at a different level. I'll talk to you more about it. And that process has led to, first, the Kyoto Protocol that was adopted in 1997, which got ratified in 2005. And that protocol was about setting up a global carbon market to incentivize carbon emission or reduction of carbon emissions. And that was a very important conclusion, a decision. And that got implemented. And later on in 2015 is when through the negotiations, and it takes a long time when you have 197 governments to come together to agree on common principles, common actions, it takes time. So in 2015 is when the Paris Agreement got adopted. And that was a very, very powerful message to the world that the multilateral system was very much engaged in addressing climate change. 
and no, no, no other time in history an agreement such as that was adopted unanimously by all governments, all government leaders. And very next year, in 2016, it, got, it, it came into existence in terms of it, it got ratified. So as of today, 185 countries have ratified the Paris Agreement. No other multilateral agreement is as robust in terms of its ratification, in terms of its engagement, in terms of its importance in the international architecture. So that is very important. And since then, last year, so we had the Paris Agreement, the agreement was great, but the agreement needed a rule book, op operational guidelines for how to implement it, how the governments will implement the, the articles, the uh, decisions of the Paris Agreement. So that happened last year, last year in Poland. Every year we have the COPs, the Conference of the Parties. <clears throat> so last year, the parties took the decision to agree on the guidelines, the rule book for the Paris Agreement work program that got adopted last year. So that was again a very important milestone. And all of that is very important because next year, 2020, is the full operationalization of the Paris Agreement. And what the Paris Agreement requires and puts all governments into action is towards global warming to be limited to 2 degrees and preferably 1.5 degrees by mid-century. So that is the target. And to support that, there is the science. Science is extremely important in the context of proving the effects, the measures that need to be taken, the time that we have to address those, and that is the IPCC. That's another abbreviation, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they do some amazing work. And these are scientists of the world, very prominent scientists. I, I, uh, Mr. Pachari, I understand he was here. So he was leading the IPCC until recently. So they produced the reports providing the scientific evidence about climate change. So that is the other. And then another terminology or another abbreviation is, are the NDCs, extremely important. One of the cornerstone of the Paris Agreement are referred to as NDCs, Nationally Determined Contributions. Every country is required to submit their nationally determined contribution to address climate change. And the next time that they will be doing that is in 2020. And we are at this stage now to ensure that governments step up their ambition to submit their actions that they would take in the uh, context of Paris Agreement. So that is the overall background, the context. And this year is also extremely important for us because this year is the setting the stage for that 2020 start of the full operationalization of the Paris Agreement. So this year we have two big events from now until the end of the year. One is in a week's time when the Secretary General of the United Nations is hosting the summit a summit on climate action where he's called the world leaders to come to New York, not with speeches, but with concrete actions of what their countries are doing or are willing to take to address climate change at a global level, at a scale, at the significant level, and not just talk, really concrete action. So let's see what comes out of it. We are very hopeful that there will be some very strong commitments that will be made in a week's time in, in New York. And the outcomes of it will feed into the COP, the Conference of the Parties, that will be held in Chile in December. That will be COP 25. So that will be another very important event. So all of these events, and then preceding this, there were several other events, the regional, uh, the national, local, and one of this one. And the reason I'm here is precisely to do that, to link up, to address the concerns, to, to convey the importance, to convey the urgency of the actions that we need to take. So it's again, as I said, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. And having so many younger people participate is extremely invigorating. It's very encouraging. So thank you very much, the Arab Youth Climate Movement, the Fatah Foundation, to bring us all here. And as I also said, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the setting we are here in today, this library. 
It's amazing. It houses over a million volumes, including material dating back, I understand, to 15th century. I just witnessed a few, just very brief examples of it, and that has created a huge uh, emotion in me to come back here with more time and study in greater detail. In facilitating our engagement, this space is a manifestation of empowerment through knowledge. And it run, when it comes to climate change, we have the knowledge, we know what we need to do, we have the tools, we have the agreements, we just need to now make sure we get on with it and implement those. So what I'll show, share with you today are a few topics that I wanted to uh, highlight and share my perspectives are as follows. Climate emergency, need to reduce the emissions and enhance the indices that I talked about. The international response, what is happening this year and uh, in the future, uh, foreseeable future in the, uh, going forward. Role of the youth, especially in Qatar and the region. And what we can all collectively do. And also to briefly talk about the economy, because the impact of, eco of climate change, whether we address it or not on the economy, are very, very important. I'll briefly talk to you about that as well. So, in terms of climate emergency, when we talk about climate change, you must have seen, heard, read in the media, it is being referred to as climate emergency, climate crisis, climate uh, uh, critical cri climate situation, climate disaster. So every kind of negative word has been attached to climate because of the urgency. And the scientific evidence is at our disposal that tells us we are in great trouble. Simply, really, we are in great trouble. Because the IPCC report that was published last year, it very clearly lays out that at the current rates of global emissions, global carbon emissions, we will not be in line with the target of the Paris Agreement to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, or preferably 1.5 degrees up to 2 degrees by mid-century. In fact, we will double it, or even more than double it. So even with one degree already that has war, the global uh, temperatures is warm, we, we are seeing the effects of it everywhere, in, in many parts of the world. And the threats of that in terms of human suffering, in terms of loss, in terms of damages, in terms of emotional uh, impact on human beings in many parts of the world, especially in the low-lying countries, in those small islands, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, in some of the Asian countries where the countries struggle to survive, and then on top of that, impacts of climate change. So we also refer to climate change as a threat multiplier. So you take any of the socio-economic security aspects of our society, and when climate change impacts are overlaid on those, they just multiply. So that's how serious it is. And here are some of the facts. Between 2015 and 19, as of today, were the five hottest years on record. At the same time, according to World Meteorological Organization, the level of carbon emissions during that time is the highest, now here it is, highest in the human life, never before. This measure has been surpassed. So think about that for a moment. The highest during human life, not recorded in history, not since the Industrial Revolution. The highest since our species began. So if that's not an emergency, hmm, what is it then? So it is clear, we must redou redouble our efforts, all of us and all, at all levels of the society. Falling short would lock in climate impacts so catastrophic that we would not be able to recognize the world that we are used to. So that's how serious it is. Now talking about reducing emissions and the nationally determined contributions, it means we must reduce global temperature gas, gas emissions 45% below 2010 levels. So we're very specific in terms of targets, what needs to happen. And there are very excellent monitoring mechanisms that are monitoring that uh, target. And we need to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, by mid-century. Those are the targets. Now, to do that, it's easy, easy to say that those are the targets. But the, to, to do that, it's a huge challenge. 
It would require an in, uh, all our ingenuity, expertise, determination that humanity can all collectively muster. It requires deep transformation, and that's what the IPCC report recommended, deep transformation in the policies, in the measures, in the way we produce and use energy, in the way we feed our populations, in the way we build and manage the cities, and the way we make progress in the industry and more. So 2030, that's only 11 years away. And to achieve that, it's a huge, huge challenge. So it must begin with more ambitious plans and actions within the NDCs. And that is the goal right now this year. But unfortunately, those plans, as I mentioned, they are not enough. And beyond the immediate danger to life, it will take almost every significant challenge we currently face, and that will turn into a very, very serious and significant threat to our existence. So we have significant work to do. What has been the international response? As I mentioned, the international response has been at a global level, at a at political level, I remain very optimistic about it, is that the governments are still very much engaged at different levels. They have agreed, as I said, to the rule book last year, and this year they are coming together to set the stage to increase the ambition through the NDCs next year. And if previous efforts were focused on defining the Paris Agreement, the, the efforts now are on climate action. And climate action is something that we will hear a lot about. It's a simple terminology, climate action, but climate action has very deep and societal implications. We all are engaged in it, every one of us in this room. And not just the governments, not just the companies, not just the energy sector, but every one of us. So this means ambition to significantly boost climate action right across the board. So 2020 is very important, as I mentioned. 2020 is when the next round of NDCs will be submitted. Because NDCs are submitted every five years. The last time it was in 2015. Next year, next it will be in 2020. And then in 2023 will be something referred to as global stock take. So then we will gather all the inputs that would be submitted next year to measure how those will be recorded and what would be the uh, collective goal of that. So we will see that. So as I said, right now, it doesn't look very good, but by, by measuring that and reporting that, highlighting the emergency and explaining to audiences like this and through you, through your engagement, we hope to be able to raise that ambition. The role of the youth and the opportunities for engagement. We know national government, now this is very important. In addressing this challenge, no one of us, no single organization, especially not the United Nations alone, or any private sector, or any government, no matter how big or small, can address this. So we all need to come together. So therefore the youth, especially youth now these days, now here is something that I say very often is, and I say this very, with, with deep conviction, that the environment today that we have, the older population like myself, the older generation like many of us in the room, we did not inherit it from our previous generation. We actually borrowed it from the future generation, the youth. And we have a huge responsibility, moral, ethical responsibility to ensure that we give that environment in a safe, resistant, re resilient, and a sound manner to the younger generation. That's what it's all about. And many of our religious beliefs, ethical, moral beliefs, teach us that. So we have to, we have to do that. So the world's youth are an essential voice at the table. So what you say, what you are conveying is important. It's being heard in the United Nations, definitely it is. We have uh, formed a constituency of the youth, and here is another example. If your, child, if your child were to run into the kitchen, if the kitchen is on fire, you would immediately run and try to go and put off the fire, save the child from any uh, burns that might, that might happen. 
So that is the kind of analogy. The world is on fire right now. So we all have to collectively take action. So youth have made it very, very clear and they will not be ignored. And they are coming together like never before, which is extremely encouraging. We don't have to look any further than the Arab Youth Climate Movement, which was started in Doha here. And it encompasses 15 Middle East and North African countries. This generation-wide movement accepts that the climate crisis requires an urgent action that was mentioned to you this morning. And we in the Climate Change Secretariat are committed to fostering the meaningful engagement of young people in the intergovernmental change, climate change process. The Qatar chapter of the AYCM, one of the co-hosts of this event, is such an example. This plan pledges to balance economic growth, environmental st stewardship, while building a sustainable environment to be achieved by public involvement. That's one of the principles of the uh, Qatar climate change. Climate, youth climate movement. In fact, we have a direct mandate under the Paris Agreement, as I mentioned, that Article 12. So, it is very clear that we have to link youth to the actions of the governments through the uh, implementation of the Paris Agreement. And one way we do that very concretely is a very important program that we impl implement, which is referred to as Action for Climate Empowerment. ACE. Interestingly, that program was launched here in Qatar when COP was held here, COP 18, in 2012. And ACE, the Action for Climate Empowerment, covers six elements of the, even the convention. And since 2012, the lessons learned in, the, in that program have provided valuable inputs for the review of the Doha work program and aided in the preparation of the new framework that all parties will again discuss and negotiate in 2020. So each country in the region beyond is encouraged to name a focal point in that action for climate empowerment. And in countries in this region, if you haven't done that, you should consider doing that and we would welcome it. Listen, I have made it very clear now the climate emergency, the actions that need to be taken, now, I remain extremely optimistic because there is, no other op there is no other alternative not to be optimistic because we have done this in the past when the world faced, was faced with enormous big challenges, ozone layer de depletion, polio, AIDS, and malaria, many other global issues. The world came together and took very, very bold and concrete actions and those issues were addressed. The ozone layer is very important, very relevant to our discussion. If we had not addressed it at the time we, we would, we did at the time with the Montreal Protocol, we would be in great, great trouble and climate change would be even worse now. So, and that required changing certain uh, polluting gases in refrigeration and air conditioning, and that was stopped. Smoking is another one. Although it's not completely eliminated, but uh, there is huge growing awareness about the impacts and the, uh, the risks of smoking. The same with AIDS. So those are global issues that the world as a community, the world as a society have addressed. So therefore, I remain very positive with also the climate, uh, climate change challenge that we have done this in the past and we can do this again. But well, we just need to try, we need to make sure that we understand the urgency of it and the tools that are available to us and what we can do with it. I mentioned economy. There is a fear, especially sometimes in this region, fortunately, that people will suffer or there will be huge economic negative impacts if we address climate change. The truth cannot be further away from that. It is just nonsense. It is not the, it's not the truth. The simple truth is that those businesses that are not preparing right now for more sustainable growth, reducing emissions, and working towards climate neutrality will be out of business if they don't read the writing on the wall. This has happened to many companies, many businesses in the recent past. We know that. It is obvious that nobody can do business in a world decimated by climate change. So we need to protect the 
environment, the world, the society that we live in, in order to do business. So it's, it's a very simple fact that we need to be aware of. But on the other hand, it's simply baffling to me why there are still companies out there who don't or won't see the obvious advantages of, of adopting more sustainable business models, reducing their emissions, capturing the related opportunities in doing so. Here are some facts. According to the new climate economy report, transitioning to low carbon sustainable growth could deliver a direct economic gain of 26 trillion through 2030 compared to business as usual. And taking ambitious climate action could generate more than 65 million jobs in low carbon environment by, by 2030. And whose jobs will those be? Those will be your jobs. Moving forward, we are talking about the, the jobs each one of you could take. So you won't be alone in this work. And here is another very encouraging statistic and, and fact. Many companies have already recognized this and there are 250 represent companies representing $28 trillion in assets have already signed to Paris Agreement goals. So it's a commitment to improving their climate performance and ensuring transparent disclosure of emissions. Yes, they're doing it because they care about climate, of course, but these people did not achieve their leadership roles by accident. They know business and they're positioning themselves for the future. And those who aren't won't be unfortunately around for a long time. Now let me talk about transition, especially as it concerns this region. It is very difficult, I know, in this region that it faces unique challenges. And those are challenges very particular to this region because we understand that fossil fuels have literally fueled the prosperity we currently enjoy today in this part of the world. Now, and fossil fuels are not going to disappear from one day to the next. That is just unrealistic and uh, it, would not, it would completely lead to collapse of the global economy. So we have to be very realistic. So what is the bottom line? Fossil fuels will be around for the foreseeable future, but they need to be converted to become part of the solution as well. So there can be little doubt that our over-reliance on fossil fuels since the industrial revolution has had consequences, got us into the trouble that we are in today. So in a world decimated by climate change, nobody will prosper. So we need to be aware of that. So this leads to my final point, that while we see the oil and gas industry and the energy sector in general as being part of the problem, but they are not, they actually are part of the solution. And I have witnessed in many uh, discussions with many governments in the region and beyond, they are taking steps. There are things happening already. But again, this will not happen overnight. And we have recognized that there has to be a transition, a just transition. And because we cannot forget about the staff and employees who are employed in that sector. So they need to be transition to newer and, and greener way of doing things and new, greener economies, greener industries. And that will happen over time. Not just here in Qatar, but throughout the world. Because the cost of not taking more ambitious climate action is ultimately more detrimental one to businesses, to communities, and to all of us. We therefore must work together. And part of this transition will include economic diversification. And this is we recognize it's much easier said than done, but it'll be necessary. And many of the youth sitting in this room recognize that, and I'm sure you will take, you'll be taking a lot of different actions towards it. And as I mentioned before, there is an enormous amount of opportunity and pr pr prosperity, just waiting for those who can capture those opportunities. And I really strongly, very, very sincerely believe in that. It's not all, it's not all doomsday. There are a lot of great opportunities out there. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, dear delegates, distinguished uh, representatives here, I have covered today, whether it's addressing our climate emergency, getting those national climate actions, developing better businesses model, none of this can happen without all of us being engaged at our different levels. Just as one nation cannot address, we, one group or one organization cannot do it either. 
So we need to get involved at all, at, in a practical, pragmatic, and a purposeful manner. And it also includes creating partnerships across the world, tackling the climate challenge from a global perspective, and taking climate action beyond borders, because climate does not really respect any borders. So we need to move beyond. We need to ensure that our message is conveyed. And today we have great technology at our hands, the social media. So we should use that, communicate, and, and, uh, uh, and offer the opportunities to everybody to take action, to be part of the movement. While the previous generation have, has no doubt left you with a challenging legacy to climate change, they have nevertheless built also an incredible foundation for success, especially for the youth. So as you move on your leadership roles, once you graduate, once you finish your studies, go into the next life, especially for the youth, this is the message for the youth, and building upon this foundation, you need to expand it and modify it to the needs of the 21st century. And what we know is that this century will be defined by those building with an eye towards sustainability and resilience in protecting the environment in which we live and we will hand over to the next generation. So the future that is clean, green and prosperous for all. So with those remarks, I'd like to end here with again thanking you for all your uh, engagement here, coming here and to the host for inviting us here and hosting us in a, this fantastic facility and we from the United Nations Climate Change Organization Secretariat and me personally we will continue to work with you, any one of you in, who is willing to engage, willing to take action, you will find us supporting your efforts. So thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. My name is Saeed Mohammed. I'm a PhD student at Queensland University of Technology. And for the rest of the session, I'll be taking care of it. So before we get the mics uh, to the people, please raise your hands. And you need to keep your questions very precise. So the only thing is, the thing we're going to do different is that we're going to give more preference to younger people to ask the questions to our speaker. So the younger people, whoever they are, so they only get given the first preference. So now, like before we get the mic, please uh, raise your hands, like one of our members will come and give you the mics. But until then, I'd just like to ask a question, uh, which is very much pertinent, like, you know, with your previous job. Um, a new report came in uh, from International Organization for Migration. It says that, like, in 2017, 18.8 million people were newly displaced in the context of sudden onset disasters. These are, like, climate-induced disasters. And on average, 24.6 million people per year will be dis were displaced. So more and more people will be uprooted and displaced like in the coming years because of various climate-related disasters. So and definitely there are going to be like an inter-country and cross-country uh, migration is going to happen. And like migration is a very politically contentious issue, not just only in Europe going from Africa, but across the world. So wh wh what do we have in store? Like, you know, that report offers quite a grim picture. There's not anything um, any pos positive, optimistic, and like because of the disasters. So, wh wh what's your take on that one? That's absolutely right, and I, uh, I think, as I mentioned, the impacts of climate change have many implications. One is, of course, the human mobility. Uh, people will be displaced, and what needs to happen with uh, with that displacement? And the previous organization that I was working with, IOM, they have many programs to prevent displacement when that happens to plan for it, and when it happens, to address it in the best possible way. Now, how to do it, there are many different ways. It's through regular migration, to providing skills to those who, who will migrate as a result of that, and then so that they can be employed in the economies where they, they would be needed. And very importantly, there are many adaptation programs, including through the, the Green Climate Facility, which need to provide funding to those countries to adapt to the impacts of climate change. So 
those reports that what you just mentioned provides the basis, the facts to those policy makers to take action. And we in the United Nations, we provide the expertise to the various options that, they, that, that exist to address the challenge, those challenges. So can we have uh, anyone please raise your hand so we're just gonna, who's having the mic? Okay, so we'll go with, we'll give, we'll take three questions and then we'll allow the speaker to answer. So until then, please, like you can just take the mic. Yes, please, go ahead. Your, your name and please keep your questions very brief. Yes. Hello, uh, good afternoon, my name is uh, Jose Saucedo. Um, when we talk about the crisis, uh, the climate crisis, uh, things can get very depressing very quickly. So my question is, um, uh, how do you inspire, how do you encourage those who think that we cannot make a difference as individuals to take action despite the enormity of the task uh, at hand? So, any, who's having the question, next one? Okay, so we have a gentleman at the front. Can you get the mic, please, there? Yeah. Oh, come on, young guys. Like, we are looking for questions. Hello? Yes. Okay, we see <coughs> one at the back there. You, see, you yeah. spoke about transformation, but I think the real transformation has not yet happened. The, I want to give just a simple analogy. What we are doing to the Earth is like, imagine a very fat man lying in hospital with a heart attack and with a hemorrhage and with all sorts of problems. What we are doing is are these doctors who are trying to reduce his blood pressure, reduce his sugar, reduce his, his troubles, but at the same time feeding him with a lot of food, allowing him to smoke and, and giving him everything. Now, the, 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 the real problem is, is the capitalism of consumer, consumerism. This is what has not been addressed yet in schools. We teach students to be successful, and successful be, meaning in business, being, being having a lot, a lot of money, having wealth, which means consumerism, which means more distraction to the environment. This has not been addressed because, because the paradigm of capitalism and consumerism is still ruling. This is a point. Okay. A point well taken, yes. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we have. Good afternoon, my name is uh, Mohammed, Mr. Sama. Thank you for coming, thank you for your speech. We are uh, great, uh, having a great pleasure. Thank you, uh, QF and the state of Qatar, of course. I will be uh, quoting some of what you have mentioned about the 1.5 degrees, the kitchen burning, what happened on the last year alone, and is this is enough? Paris Convention, United Nations, and the rest of the world. Are we on the implementation stage yet, or are we a little bit behind? Um, from this, I would like to have um, a clear uh, vision, whether we are really behind or ahead of the game. Thank you. So we'll just uh, respond to the questions and then we'll come back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Those are all extremely thoughtful questions. And I, at the outset, there are no uh, easy answers to those questions. I, I already admit that. I take the last question first. I, uh, the brief response to that is no. We are not on track. We are not seeing the kind of actions that the governments need to take to r stop prevent and manage the implications of uh, climate change. No, it's not. And that is the reason why Secretary General in the United Nations, now the biggest priority this year and in the foreseeable future is addressing climate change. Secretary General has openly recognized that and he's conveying that to everybody. And that's why he has called for this climate summit to enhance that climate action and asking the global leaders to come with concrete actions. So while I remain cautiously optimistic, it's still not enough. But we still have a bit more time to turn things around. And that's the role of the United Nations to all, for all of us to step that up. So I fully agree with you. Uh, the, we need to change the paradigm. The, what you described is absolutely right. We are consumed by consumerism. And uh, the 
these, the success that we measure is through GDP, which is unfortunately no longer valid in the current environment if we continue to do that. But the fact remains, we are 7 billion right now in the world population, and that is increasing. And that population requires the energy, the resources, the food, the land, the clean air to survive. What we need to do, as you rightly said, we need to completely transform the paradigm of how we manage those, that population, the needs of that population. And that's what it's about. So while there are no quick fix solutions to it, the trajectory, the Paris Agreement, the rule book of last year, the engagement of youth now, they are waking up, they are striking every Friday. All of that, if we put those pieces together, shows that we are moving slowly but surely in the right direction. But my job and our job is to increase the pace of that and to bring about the understanding of exactly what you said, that those, the, that business model or the way we have constructed the world economy and the production and the consumerism is just not right. It has to change. So I remain committed. We have to because there is no other alternative. We can't give it up. And we say we can't because we are too small to do that. And that leads me to the first question. How do we inspire individually? And what are the specific actions? Just listen to the uh, school children this morning uh, who came up with very concrete, very interesting and almost innovative solutions to the problems that they are seeing in terms of waste management, circular economy, the way uh, plastic uh, is being used and uh, the water salination and the impacts of it and what to do with the residual salt. I mean, these kids are amazing. So the solutions are there. The kids understand it. So we just need to bring it together. So that, that gives me enormous uh, motivation to continue because look it's for them and they know what they're doing what they want and they even have the solutions so my job is to go back to the United Nations and and to provide the incentives the platform and to bring those uh, kids and the solutions together and so that those can be amplified scaled up so there is a lot to be done and I think we should all remain engaged and uh, hopefully motivated to take that action so, uh, who's having the mic up there? Okay, I can see a person up there. And okay, uh, so we'll just go with the lady first, and then we'll come back to you. So, yeah. So, thank you for coming today. Uh, my question is brief. In the title of your lecture, who is we? And I'd also like to go back to the gentleman in the front who mentioned the C word, and that is capitalism. Can we meaningfully talk about climate change? without talking about how capitalism is forcing us to mortgage the future of our youth and how global capitalism has constructed the world in such a way that we are killing ourselves and placing an unfair burden on the people most disproportionately affected by climate change. Because while I do agree that we all have a stake in maintaining the planet, it is still very true that 71% of global CO2 emissions, there are three companies in the world responsible for that. The burning of the Amazon rainforest, Bolsonaro is responsible for that. And the heavily subsidized agriculture industry, which creates more methane gas and CO2 than all vehicles in the world combined, which is enabled by the capitalist system that we have been building on as humans for hundreds of years now, that's what we're enabling. So can we have a meaningful discussion on solving climate change without also meaningfully talking about how that inevitably will entail the end of capitalism as we understand it in the world today. Thank you for the brief question. Thank you. <laughs> so we can have that one, yes. This is Rajesh Kumar. Like a UNESCO, uh, protecting the heric uh, heritage and archaeological sites, why can't uh, UE and FCCC adapt the large water resources and uh, rainforest all over the world and prevent those from any further damages? And one more question. Uh, in the developing countries, in the name of the development, large number of trees are being cut and planting small plants in the name of the beautification. 
what are the steps taken by UNFSS in promoting the plantation of trees all over the world? Okay, so we have a question. At, okay, so we have a gentleman over here. Uh, so is anyone closer to the mic? Uh, okay, that's fine. I can. Uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Highly uh, insufficient, basically. I wanted to ask if the United Nations has ever considered to create a curriculum for the schools of the world. So we'll just take the questions we have got. Again, capitalism. I guess that's a very, very elephant in the room that most of the people they don't uh, talk about it. So, yeah. Again, uh, very thoughtful questions. Uh, Again, if you, I'd like to take the last question first about the curriculum. Yes, there is, uh, but not uh, as perhaps well known and well developed as it should be, but there are elements of it. Uh, if you go on our website, uh, there is already uh, incorporating all the SDGs. There is curriculum that is being sent to many, many schools around the world on how those SDGs can be incorporated in the learning at the early stage. But that has not yet been taken up at the national or even global uh, uh, institutions which define those curricula. So that is, there are steps being taken and more needs to be done on that one. Uh, with regard to the water resources and rainforest and why more plants can, are not being planted and what UNFCCC can do. I can, be, uh, I can go into details of it. There is the Coronivia work plan in the UNFCCC process, which uh, precisely talks about the use of land, agriculture, and all the process related to that, including the trees, the forestation, the uh, rainforest, the protection of the rainforest. So there is actually a very important a mandate given in the process that covers all of that, not just the plantation of trees, but way beyond that, very importantly, how the land is used. It's not just about planting trees, it's what kind of trees, in what uh, environment, and, and what will happen to those trees, and how to protect that. So it's, it's a very complex area, and yes, that is already happening. The capitalism, uh, mortgaging the future, all of that, what you said is absolutely right. There is one analogy that I uh, often think about is Stone Age didn't end because there was lack of stones. It ended because there were better ways of living using the resources and that realization needs to come about and I already see that that is happening. And that is the way to change the business models, The the capitalism, the consumerism that we have created. I mean, it didn't come from out of nowhere. We did this. We created those conditions. We created those markets. We created those demands. So it's we, when you said, who is we? It's me, you, everybody in this room. We need to change that. We need to change the behavior. I don't know whether I'm responding specifically to your question, but that is what I think. Okay, we'll just take a last set of questions. Okay, we have finally a young lady, and then uh, please mic at the back, very end. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Which um, school you are from? OSAC, okay. Spanish school. Uh, thank you for being here today. Um, as you know, airplanes have caused a large impact on the crisis of climate change. Would you encourage implementing a heavier tax on the aviation industry? Okay, so, yes. Yeah. Um, can you please give the mic at the very end there? Okay, so there's one up there. Until then, you come there, yes. Um, good afternoon, my name is Alex. Um, and my question is, what are three tips that you would give to individuals to take from countries with the largest carbon footprints out there? Um, hi, thank you for your lecture. I'm from ASD and I had a question um, about the fossil fuels not being gone overnight. So you mentioned that they have to be a part of the solution. Um, how would a just transition happen without taking too long, especially in this region? 
Okay, this will be the last set of questions, so we'll give time to respond. So, Thank you. Uh, on the first question about taxing the aviation industry, uh, if you look at the ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Authority, they already have uh, decided on a framework which is called Corsia, and it precisely does that. It is going to be implemented very soon, and you're, you're right, I think uh, uh, those industries, those methods of transportation that emit more carbon emissions need to be taxed. And there, those are being ha that's already happening, but there is already that framework. And not just aviation, there is maritime industry, there is uh, transportation industry in, in all of those areas. And in relation to that, this year is going to be extremely important because as I mentioned in Chile, one of the decisions that we are working towards is to create a market mechanism that links to Article 6 of the uh, Paris Agreement to provide a global market mechanism where carbon emissions are taxed, traded, compensated. A very robust, uh, which would be based on very clear, transparent criteria. So the work is underway. Uh, link to the second question also, whether there are any free tip, tips to countries who have the largest footprint, it is that market mechanism that we are working towards. And once that is agreed upon this year, we really hope it would be, that would provide a very robust and extremely effective system of uh, taxing those who uh, pollute the greatest. The just transition, yes, it'll take time. Now, how, how long or how, how short? It is throughout the these sectors all sectors of the society in all parts of the world and there cannot be one size that will fit all. Some economies, some transitions will take longer, others shorter time in this region, it will probably take longer. But at the same time, they need to move towards more renewable and uh, sources of energy and use the uh, uh, capital that they have generated or they will generate towards more sustainable, more responsible and even to go out and help those countries who need their support. Thank you all for coming here at Last Lakeway Continent. So, you have a very good day.